for the highlight of our day. <laughs> Dr. Bedlack. Now, I don't need sunglasses today, Rick. <laughs> Dr. Bedlack is unbelievable. He is a professor of neurology at Duke, and he's well known in the ALS community. He directs the ALS clinic at Duke, but he leads the international ALS Untangled program uh, and the ALS Reversals program that everybody knows about and is really the founder of something called CRLI, Clinical Research Learning Institute, which is specifically for uh, PALS and supporters of ALS to learn how to advocate for ALS and learn a little bit about the research process. Uh, and we're hoping to have a CRLI here in Philadelphia again soon. We've done two already. His awards are numerous, but they include Best Virology Teacher, Healthcare Hero, Straight Hope and Caring Award, America's Best Doctor, AAN Patient Advocate of the Year Award, Rasmus Rasmussen ALS Patient Advocate of the Year, and many more. And he truly is in it for you. And I, I have so much respect for Rick. It is just a real pleasure to, to be his friend and to have him here today. Uh, as you can see, he's published more than 100 articles, I don't know, and every couple of weeks I'm getting an ALS Untangled article to review, so he's terrific. And today, Rick is gonna talk to you about Untangling the X-Files. Rick, come on up. I'm as tall as you are, Miss. Use this stool for the good Oh, sorry. Well, that was really nice, Tara. I really appreciate that. It's always great to come back to Philadelphia. Philadelphia is the home of two of my favorite things in the world Jim's cheesesteak, my number one favorite food in the world, and Terry Harmon Patterson, my number one favorite ALS doctor in the world. I really can't pay her a higher compliment than this. If I ever get ALS, I'm moving to Philadelphia so Terry can be my doctor. <laughs> so I'm gonna talk to you today about something really weird. It's a wild ride that I've been on for the past 10 years. It's something that I think sounds a lot like an episode of The X-Files. And as I look around the room, I see a lot of young faces, so I'm not sure people even remember what The X-Files was. It was a TV show, it ran for most of the 90s. It actually made a little comeback from nobody saw those episodes. <laughs> and it centered around a guy named Fox Mulder. And so when Fox was a kid, he was supposed to be watching his baby sister, Samantha. And she disappeared, never to be seen again. Now the way he remembered it, she was kidnapped by aliens. Of course, nobody believed him that this is what happened. And so Fox spent the rest of his life trying to prove to the world that aliens and other supernatural creatures were real. Every episode of The X-Files would start with some really strange occurrence, and Fox Mulder and his team would investigate, and they would usually find some rational explanation. I had my own version of Samantha early in my career. I saw a 60-year-old university professor, unfortunately had to tell her that she had ALS. She was pretty early in the course of it when I saw her just a little bit of slurred speech, a little bit more arm and leg weakness, but still able to, to work with some equipment. No obvious cognitive or behavioral problems. And I sat down and I had that talk with her about what the disease is. And I presented her with stage-appropriate evidence-based options, which at that time included really is all and multidisciplinary team care. And I also told her that I had some research studies open. I asked her if she wanted to participate in one of those. Much to my surprise, this very smart woman said, sure, I'll I'll be happy to take that medicine and come to your clinic, but I'm gonna pass on the research study. Instead, what I've decided to do is something called Dean Crafts Energy Healing, something that I saw on this website. Now, she said she couldn't really explain to me how this was supposed to work, but she couldn't get away from this video that was on the website that I hope will play. In 1985, Nelda Buss was diagnosed with ALS, amyotrophic lateral sclerosis better known as Lou Gehrig's disease. It was my birthday, I was 43 years old, and they told me I had Lou Gehrig's disease. Well, they actually said amyotrophic lateral sclerosis, and I still wasn't real sure what that was. 
ALS is a medical mystery. There is no known cause and no known cure. The established medical profession, they just said goodbye, see you, have a good life, live it to your fullest. The disease inevitably progresses from partial to complete paralysis of all the muscles in the body. She just kept getting progressively worse and I guess from the time she was uh, diagnosed until she was uh, basically an invalid was only about six months or something. In the final stages of ALS, Nelda had become a quadriplegic, unable to move but mentally alert and aware that she was about to die. I gave away most of my good clothing that I had and I had my dress all picked out for what I was to be buried in. Then Nelda heard about Dean Kraft. And it was just such a relief to talk to him. I said that the doctors say there is, there's no hope and he said, well, he said that's not always true. Kraft did his laying on of hands for three months and then they had a small but significant breakthrough. In May, Glenn was showering me and I could move my toe and that was so exciting. After her toes, Nelda slowly regained movement in her fingers, then her back muscles. Soon she could control her hands, then her arms and her legs. Nelda worked very hard on her own physical exercise regimen, in addition to treatments from Dean Kraft. Her family videotaped her progress over the course of a year. It's wonderful to see her and her family being together and, and enjoying life together. Words cannot express the feeling that one has when this happens. Okay. How's that? Everything has changed. She's back and she's doing more than she ever did before. I mean, it's great to have a mother. It really is. Well, I hope you'll agree that's a pretty amazing video. So for the purposes of today's talk, Dean Kraft's energy healing is an example of something I'm going to call an alternative or off-label therapy. I'm going to abbreviate those as AOTs and define them as treatments that are advertised to slow, stop, or reverse ALS without what most scientists would consider to be very good evidence. It turns out that Samantha is not the only one who becomes interested in AOTs. In fact, surveys suggest that most people with ALS will try at least one of these things over the course of their disease. Why do they do it? Well, the current treatments that we have in the clinic, well, they're certainly better than they were 20 years ago. They don't stop or reverse the disease. And even the things in the pipeline, we hope will slow the disease down, but we don't have that home run lurking out there in the next couple of years. So, like this old X-Files poster slogan, patients and families want to believe that there's something better out there. And when you ask them specifically why they're trying these things, 10% say they think they'll find a cure, 20% think they'll find something to make them better, and 50% think they'll find something to slow progression. Now onto that difficult background comes the internet, which makes it easier than it's ever been for someone who wants something like an AOT to find it. If you take out your phone right now and you do a Google search for ALS treatment, you'll come up with double-digit millions of hits. Now, not all of those are AOTs, but a lot of them are, including some of the first ones that come up. The other thing about the internet is that there's no internet police to hold people to their claims. So proponents, the people that are selling AOTs, can say pretty much whatever they want to about it. And some of the, the very common things that I see on websites advertising AOTs are phrases like world's most relied upon, clinically proven, and guaranteed. And if you look at the ends of the blue arrows, it's kind of small there on the screen, but this is a screenshot from an AOT called Mototab. And I remember a few years back when a patient brought this to me and said, Doc, how come you didn't tell me about this? You're supposed to be an ALS expert. And this is supposed to be the world's most relied upon treatment. How do you not know about this? Um, so what kind of evidence is actually offered to support claims like these? Well, unfortunately, in most cases, absolutely none. So if you were to click on some of the links that are on this website, you would come to a dead end that says clinical studies will soon be posted. And if you look at the date of the website, it's been around for 10 years or more. So how big is the research study that it takes 10 years or more to download onto the website? It must be enormous. 
Another very common type of evidence that used to support ALTs is called an anecdote. Anecdotes are short stories about someone who tried something and usually had a really good outcome from it. So that Nelda Boost video that I showed you in the beginning, that's an example of an anecdote. Here's another one. This one comes from a product uh, off of a company website called GM604. The company's name is Genervon. And it says, after reviewing this patient's past medical history, it's in the doctor's opinion that the patient's greatly benefited from GM604. During our initial assessment, this patient had rapid tongue fasciculation. <coughs> this improved. The patient also stopped biting their tongue. This is a reversal. Plus, the patient's limb progression has completely plateaued. In other words, it stopped progressing. Okay? Well, again, I think you'll agree that that story is interesting, but there's some things we have to think about, right? There's some potential problems with a story like this. The first problem is we don't really know who this person is or how their ALS, ALS diagnosis was confirmed. So there's an old cartoon from the magazine New Yorker that says on the internet, nobody knows you're a dog. And it actually turns out to be worse than that. So there's at least one example of a company out there that was found to have completely fabricated anecdotes in support of its product. This was a facelift company they had these amazing before and after pictures on their website and the product, of course, didn't work like that. So people took them to court and on the witness stand, employees at the company said their boss told them to just, you know, airbrush the pictures just to fabricate these amazing results. The company had to pay a small fine. Another problem with anecdotes is that the outcome measures that were given are often of uncertain clinical significance. So that Genervon anecdote talks about a reduction in fasciculation frequency. Fasciculations are muscle twitches. A reduction in frequency means they became less obvious, less frequent. What does that really mean? Well, it turns out that people have studied fasciculations and there's no relationship between how many fasciculations a person has and how fast the disease is gonna progress. And there's no relationship between where the fasciculations are and where the disease is gonna move next. So it's not really clear why a reduction in fasciculation frequency would have any meaning at all. The biggest problem with anecdotes is that they often fail to account for the natural history of the disease. So the Genervon anecdote talks about a plateau in limb progression since the person started taking that medicine, GM604, 12 weeks ago. Okay? How important is that? Well, if this disease, ALS, was a straight line down every day, every patient was weaker than they were the day before, that would be important. But it turns out that's not the case. So a few years ago, my colleagues and I looked in the largest available database of longitudinal patient information. It's called PROACT. These are thousands of patients who've been in clinical trials in the past. And we looked to see how did people actually progress when they were on placebos in clinical trials. And so if you look at that line in the upper right hand corner, that's the ALS functional rating scale over time for one patient on a placebo. Does that look like a straight line down where every day that person was getting worse? No, there's a period of time when they were getting worse and then for many months they were completely stable and then toward the end they actually started to improve a few points. And so we kind of put everybody together in the, in the graph on the lower right hand corner. Each one of those lines of a different color is different degrees of ALS functional rating scale stability or improvement lasting different amounts of time. So if you look at the Duke blue line, that's the ALS functional rating scale being stable. So it's telling you the percentage of patients in that database that had a stable functional rating scale lasting different amounts of time. And as you might expect, there's a lot of people who had a stable scale that lasted only a small amount of time, and not too many who had a stable scale lasting for a year. But to answer the Genervon question, I drew a line along that, along that blue uh, curve, and that's the six-week line. So that's what Genervon was talking about, that the patient was on the medicine for six weeks and they were stable. What percentage of people on a placebo would be expected to have that effect? It turns out to be 75%. So you can't use a story that says that someone's strength didn't get worse for six weeks as evidence that a medication works. That's just the natural history of ALS. 
if you didn't recognize those flaws in that story, don't feel that. It turns out, as it says in this Scientific American article, that most non-scientists have a hard time with anecdotes. They don't recognize the potential problems. In fact, most non-scientists think of anecdotes as just as good as a randomized clinical trial. Now, why is that? Well, the article goes on to hypothesize that maybe it's evolution. It says, we've evolved brains that pay attention to anecdotes because false positives, believing there's no connection between two things when there is, that's usually harmless. But false negatives, believing things aren't connected, that mistake might take you out of the gene pool. Whatever the reason for people misinterpreting these, the consequences of it are clear. People might be overestimating the amount of benefit that they could get from an AOT. At the same time, there's evidence that people are underestimating the amount of harm that can come from AOTs. And there clearly have been harms to patients with ALS. There have been financial harms. Some AOTs cost hundreds, some cost thousands, some cost hundreds of thousands of dollars per cycle. There are physical harms. We have found evidence of people who suffered infections, who suffered blood clots. One of the most amazing examples of a harm coming from an AOT is in that article that you probably can't read in the upper left-hand corner of the slide. That's from the New England Journal of Medicine. It's a case report of a person who went off and bought stem cells from a foreign country, from a clinic in a foreign country. And they came home and not only were they no better from their disease, but they actually started to have new symptoms. And it turned out after a workup that they had a tumor. And when that tumor was biopsied, it was found to be comprised of someone else's cells. In other words, that person paid thousands of dollars to be injected with cancer cells in another country. We've even found deaths from products that are listed as perfectly safe by the person selling them. One of the most subtle types of harms that comes from the pursuit of AOTs is scientific harms. So it turns out when we do clinical trials, we have a really hard time getting people to enroll. Low enrollment, we enroll about one to two patients per site per month in a trial. Even though a busy clinic like Terry's or mine, we might see 60 or 80 patients in a month, only one or two enroll in clinical trials. Now there's lots of reasons for that. Some of it has to do with the trials that we do. The trials are very restrictive. Some of it has to do with um, the opinions of patients. Sometimes patients don't like the design of the trials. They don't like trials that have placebos. They don't like trials that require them to come in for lots of visits. They don't like trials where it's gonna be years before they'll find out the results. There's a lot of reasons, but certainly one reason, and what you saw with Samantha in the beginning, is that people choose to pursue an AOT instead of coming into a clinical trial. This is just an aside. I find this to be fascinating. Most of the evidence for harms from AOTs, just like the evidence of benefits, it's in the form of anecdotes. So I've wondered to myself, how come anecdotes about harm are less influential than anecdotes about benefit? And I think it comes down to a couple of things. First is this comment that I've heard from patients over and over again when we talk about an AOT and, and I try to dissuade a person from doing it. They say, Doc, I already have ALS. What worse could happen to me? Well, you saw on the last slide, you could have ALS and a $10,000 debt. You could have ALS and you could have a blood clot or a tumor comprised of someone else's cells. So there are worse things that can happen. The other issue is that the anecdotes describing harm are not that easy for patients to find. They tend not to be on the website of the proponent who's trying to sell the thing for obvious reasons. Sometimes they're in the medical literature, but that's not always easy for patients and families to access. So for example, on this slide, there's an article about a stem cell clinic that was very popular in China a few years ago. And one of my colleagues, Dr. Vandenberg, actually went there. He wrote an extensive review of the clinic and he followed some of the patients that had the stem cells. And he described that not only did nobody get better, but there clearly were harms that were not being described by the person running the clinic. If you were a patient and you wanted to read that article, you'd have to pay $75. So I was frustrated by all this. And back in 2009, I decided to do something about it. I decided to start this program, ALS Untangled. And my idea was to put together a team of experts, clinicians and scientists that have 
the training and experience to be able to evaluate these things, to get them to work together, to write reviews that would be accessible to the patients and families, hopefully to help patients and families make more informed decisions about these things. And there's three parts to this program. The first part is where do we get our ideas? The second is how do we do the reviews? And the third is how do we get the information back to patients and families who asked about it in the first place? So inputs come from all over the place, right? They're coming from all over the world. They come in through all different sources. They can come in through a face-to-face -face visit. If one of you asks Terry about an AOT, next time you see her, she'll forward it on to me. They can come in through emails, my emails all over the internet. Most frequently now, they come in through Twitter. And there's a lot of nice things about Twitter. In spite of what you've heard in the past couple of years, there are some good things about Twitter. <laughs> First, you don't need to remember anyone's specific name or email address, just one keyword. In this case, the word is ALS Untangled. If anybody today, tonight, tomorrow, sends a tweet out that says, ALS Untangled, I'm interested in X, Y, Z, I will find that, it will go directly to my phone. And the other nice thing about Twitter is you can get an idea of how many people care about what you're doing by looking at the number of Twitter followers that you have. And so you can see that number over on the left-hand side of the slide. Earlier this year, I got really excited. I ran home and I told my wife, guess what, I got 3,700 Twitter followers. And her response was, well, Lady Gaga has 33 million. <laughs> and I said, you do realize she has her own stylist and I've got to put the books together. <laughs> But with all these, all these ways for people to get their ideas to us, the ideas are coming pouring in. We now have more than 400 AOTs that patients have asked us to review. And we've listed these on the open review section of our ALS Untangled website. With so many things that we've been asked about, we've had to find a way to prioritize these. And we're doing it in two ways. The first is by votes. Anybody in the world can vote for their favorite AOT by going on our website and clicking the vote button next to the name of that AOT. The other thing is we've created something called a multiplier. We multiply the votes by either zero, one, or two, depending on the amount of information we can find about it. So your AOT would be multiplied by zero if we can't even figure out what it is. By one, if we can understand what it is, but it doesn't seem like anyone's ever done a clinical trial of it. And by two, if we can find a clinical trial published somewhere on it. The reviews. Thankfully, it's not just me working on this. Just like Fox Mulder had a team, I've got a team. There's now 120 clinicians and scientists from across 10 countries working on ALS Untangled together. And we've invented SOPs, standard operating procedures that guide everything we do, from specifically how we gather information, to how we write the article, to how we crowdsource it and publish it. And all of our SOPs revolve around something we invented, which is called the table of evidence. So every AOT is now reviewed across five different categories. Mechanistic plausibility, preclinical, case reports, trials, and risks. And within each of the five categories, we assign a letter grade ranging from A to F, depending on the exact specific type of information we can find. So if we take cases for a second, those are anecdotes, right? So you'd get a D if we could find in a chat room someplace that somebody says they took this thing and they got better. But that's all we could find. We could move that up to a C if we could actually find that person and get their medical records and prove that they really had ALS and prove that they really did get better on some objective measurement. You'd get a B if we could find multiple people like that and an A if there were multiple people like that with validated diagnoses and improvements published in a peer-reviewed journal. So there's a lot of things we can do with this. One of the things we can do is help you with anecdotes. We can put all the positive ones and the negative ones in the same place so you can get a very well-rounded impression of what this AOT does. And we can temper conclusions based on our knowledge of the odd natural history of ALS. So once we have a draft, we send it around to the team and we crowdsource it. And eventually we all agree on what it should look like. And then we send it into a medical journal, which is called ALS and Frontal Temporal Degeneration. The editor of that journal gives it one last read and then publishes it. All of our articles are published by something called free open access. So unlike almost everything else in the medical journals these days, patients will never have to pay a penny to read any of these ALS Untangled reviews. 
We also publish them on our website, along with their table of evidence grades, in case you just want to see the grades. We've published 49 of these reviews so far. Most recently, we've partnered with a group called CREATE. This is a, a National Institute of Health Rare Disease Clinical Research Network that's out of Miami. And we've actually cr uh, created something called podcasts. It's come to our attention that uh, in 2019, a lot of people like to just listen to their information rather than read it. So we've now got short podcasts. They take about five minutes to listen to, and these are kind of like an interview summary of what each review said. So each of these reviews takes me about 40 hours. So just to review one AOT takes me about 40 hours. It's a lot of work. And you might ask, well, how do you know it's worth it? Well, what I would say is, first of all, we know that people are reading these. So the ALS FTD Journal keeps a running list of the 10 most downloaded articles in its history. And we have eight out of the, first, out of the top 10, including the top six. Some of our individual reviews have more than 30,000 downloads. That's kind of amazing. You know, I've published a lot of articles, as Terry mentioned in the beginning. Some are in very prestigious journals, like Science. If they have 300 downloads, I'm thrilled. So for one of these ALS Untangled reviews to have 30,000 downloads is amazing. Collectively, these have over 120,000 downloads. And the podcasts that we just started last year are already getting hundreds of listens each month. So there's that. There's also the fact that I've learned a lot of things since I started at Lost Untangled, things I had no idea were out there. First of all, I learned some things about these proponents, the people selling the AOTs. I had this vision in my mind that these were like the Wild West snake oil salesmen, that these were con artists. And it turns out we found a few like that. You can read about um, uh, maybe the worst of the worst if you uh, go on the 60 Minutes website and look for a story called 21st Century Snake Oil. So we actually did one of the Alice Untangled reviews with 60 Minutes. There was a guy down in Mexico calling himself Dr. Larry Stowe, and he had this protocol that he was telling people would have them up out of their wheelchairs and back to doing everything they used to do in just a few weeks, which doesn't even really make any scientific sense. So 60 Minutes went down, they investigated Larry Stowe. Turned out Larry Stowe didn't even have a medical degree. The piece of paper on his wall was forged and uh, none of the things that he was telling patients could be validated. He disappeared for a while, he was eventually captured and <coughs> imprisoned. But that's the minority of these folks. So most of the proponents that I've met are what I call true believers. They have a good heart. They really think that they have found something that helps people. They just don't have either the knowledge or the interest in trying to prove it. So an example is the guy in this picture. So this is me with a guy named Dr. Joseph Hickey. Dr. Hickey runs a clinic in uh, Hilton Head, South Carolina, and he believes that heavy metals cause ALS and many other of the world's worst diseases. So how do I know that Dr. Hickey believes this? Well, Dr. Hickey showed me the inside of his mouth and his wife's mouth. They've had all their fillings removed. When this clinic closes, Dr. Hickey and his wife chelate each other. They hook themselves up to IVs to suck the metals out of their bodies. So I have no doubt in my mind that he believes this, but he doesn't have any proof of it. I will say that these proponents do some things really well with their patients that mainstream doctors need to pay attention to. So when I was in Dr. Hickey's office, I got to talk to a few people with ALS and I asked them how they got there. And their story was remarkably similar. They said they started off in a big name, mainstream ALS clinic, and they felt like, all they got was gloom and doom. That there wasn't any optimism, there wasn't any hope. They felt like the doctors there didn't respect their ideas, that their ideas were just immediately shot down. And in fact, when they would call or email, sometimes it would be days or weeks or never before they would get a response from their doctors. <coughs> Dr. Hickey was the polar opposite of this. He was probably the most optimistic, most respectful, most responsive doctor that I've ever met. And I now say to young people, if you're gonna go into ALS, those are three things you have to embrace. Optimism, respect for your patient's ideas, and responsiveness. Let me take a drink. <coughs> I also learned some things about these AOTs themselves. When I started this program, I thought these were gonna be as bogus as some of those monsters on the X-Files that were 
just people under rugs. <clears throat> and it turns out we have found a lot of bogus things, but we also found a lot of things that look really promising. Things that have plausible mechanisms and really things that we should be studying. And here's just a short list. <clears throat> so there's something out there called lunacin, a product that comes from soybeans that alters histone acetylation, a mechanism we've gone after in the clinical trial before, and a company called Amylix is going after again. MitoQ, an antioxidant, as you know, there's an FDA approved drug for ALS that's an antioxidant. Proteandum, L-steering, coconut oil, cannabis, basis, resveratrol, and then maybe the weirdest one of all, fecal transplants. I'll never forget the day that this popped up on my phone. I was at dinner with my wife. And I looked down and I said, oh, look at that. Somebody must have spelled this wrong. It must be fetal, fetal stem cell transplants. Turns out, no, they were actually asking, is there any benefit to transferring the stool of a healthy person into the colon of a person with ALS? And at first I thought it was the craziest thing I'd ever read. And when I finished writing this article, I said, this is actually something we need to study. It turns out there actually is some evidence that the family of bacteria that live in the colon might actually be able to influence the progression of a neurodegenerative disease like ALS that that family of bacteria called the microbiome might actually be altered in people with ALS. The question is whether a fecal transplant could actually restore that back to a normal pattern. <coughs> but without a doubt, the most amazing thing I've learned in the 10 years that I've been running this program is that that woman in that video that I showed you in the beginning, she's real. So I found her, I used our SOPs, I found her on social media, I talked to her on the phone. She sent me her medical records. And I remember going through those records, I was about halfway through this big box, and I turned to my wife and I said, you know how people in the ALS world already think I'm nuts? <laughs> Wait till the next big meeting, when I stand at the microphone and I say, I'm finally sure it's energy healing. <laughs> because, I mean, reading through those records, I'm certain this woman had ALS. She saw someone who I know and respect, Dr. Larry Phillips at the University of Virginia, she had a classic story. She had classic exams documented by Dr. Phillips himself. She had classic EMGs. She had lots of tests for ALS mimics that all came back normal. Dr. Phillips' notes suggest that she progressed to where she was paralyzed and probably quite near death. And now, years later, she's back to normal. I had never heard of that before. So um, I asked myself, is there anybody else out there? And I started polling some of my colleagues and I started putting out things on social media, asking people to send me records. And I got an avalanche of medical records, over 200 sets of medical records from all over the world, from people who think they had an ALS reversal. Now, I'm gonna set a very high bar for calling something an ALS reversal. And at this point, I would say I have 41 people like this. 41 people like the woman in the video that I really think their records have enough to support a diagnosis of ALS and that are either dramatically or completely back to normal. So, what do we do with these folks? Well, in my opinion, what happened to them is so different than what was supposed to happen, that we have to study this. We have to figure out, if, is there a key somewhere in these people for how we can make this happen to everybody? So when you want to study something, you got to come up with hypotheses. So, the first thing, obviously, that we thought of is, well, a lot of these people did stuff. You know, the boost took energy healing, other people did other things. Is it possible that these patients actually found something that works for ALS? That might sound unusual, but it turns out that is a validated model for drug discovery. It's called serendipitous drug discovery. And there's many examples, many examples where patients discovered something that doctors had no idea was gonna happen. Does anyone know the most famous example of that? You ever heard of Viagra? <laughs> Did you know that Pfizer was studying that for heart disease? And at the end of a negative study, it was gonna go into garbage, except for the guys in the study said, is there any way to get some more of that? <laughs> and, then, and Pfizer said, wait a minute, we had no idea that it did this. We need to actually do a clinical trial, and it became the first in class FDA approved medication for erectile dysfunction in men is a billion dollar drug discovered by accident by patients. And there's also an example in ALS, New Dexta. So we studied this drug, New Dexta, to see if it could slow the progression of ALS, and it didn't. 
and it would have been thrown away except that patients came forward and said, this really like helped that problem I was having controlling my laughing and crying, that thing that you call pseudo vulgar affect. So the company said, hmm, okay, let's study it for that. And it worked. And it's now the only FDA approved medication for that problem. So what if some of the things that patients took are the reasons that they got better? In order to try to investigate that, I started a program called ROAR, Replication of ALS Reversals. <clears throat> this is gonna be a program of small pilot trials of some of these AOTs that are associated with ALS reversals. Now, because we are looking for such a gigantic signal, the biggest signal anyone's ever looked for in the history of ALS research, ALS reversal, we can do some fun things with these trials that address some of those other problems I told you about before that affect our enrollment. First of all, we can have very wide inclusion criteria. We don't need to reduce the noise in our study down so low to find a small signal. We're looking for a huge signal. Almost anybody could be in one of these studies. Doesn't matter how far progressed you are. The woman in the video was progressed to the point where she couldn't move, she was having trouble breathing, she couldn't swallow. You have those problems, you can be in one of these studies. We don't need a placebo in these studies. If I have a person who's paralyzed for five years and then they recover completely normal motor function, how could that possibly be a placebo effect? We don't need a lot of in-person visits. We're looking for very gross changes here. We can teach people to measure those things in themselves. They can do it from home. They can enter their own data on a website. Like for example, we're using a website called Patients Like Me. We're teaching people how to use that website and how to measure the ALS functional rating scale and we ask them to go on that website once a month and enter their own data. And you know, a few times during the study we check to make sure they're doing it right. But the nice thing is, you don't have to come to clinic all those times. When you use a publicly available website like Patients Like Me, the results of these raw studies become available in real time. You don't have to wait three years to find out if one of my trials was positive. You can look in at any time on Patients Like Me and see what's happening to everyone in my study. And finally, we're gonna publish all the protocols in this program. As soon as they get IRB approved, we're gonna publish them on our website. Why are we doing that? Well, because we know that there's people all over the world that wanna try stuff, we talked about that before, and at least if we put a protocol out there, they could try something that seems reasonably plausible and reasonably safe, right? Those are the things that we're gonna be looking at. So somebody in Iceland who can't be in a clinical trial could find one of our protocols and talk about it with their doctor and decide if they want to start the exact same thing that we're studying. So guess what I wanted to study first with the ROAR program? Energy yielding. I mean, that is still the most amazing video that I've ever seen. So I remember reaching out to the guy in charge of that website, Dean Kraft, and explaining who I was and what I wanted to do. And uh, he sent me an email. And in the email it said, Richard, for those who believe, no proof is necessary. And for those who don't, no proof will ever be enough. And that was the last time he ever responded to me. And, uh, unfortunately, he died last year, so we'll never know if Dean Kraft could do something magic. So what I decided to study first is this product that I mentioned earlier, Lunison. So I first heard about Lunison when somebody forwarded me a video of a guy in Providence, Rhode Island, the guy in this picture right here, Mike McDuff, he was actually on the news, and he told the story of uh, being diagnosed with ALS at Providence and also at Mass General Hospital, <laughs> and of uh, progressing to where he couldn't speak, he couldn't swallow, he had to have a feeding tube, and he started this program, uh, this Lunison product, and within six months, his speech and swallowing recovered to completely normal, and he had his feeding tube taken out. He sent me his records, I agreed with the diagnosis of ALS and with the documented improvements, I talked to his doctors, I talked to his therapists, they agreed, they had seen a dramatic improvement that they had never seen before in another person with ALS. This product appeared to have a plausible mechanism. Again, it comes from soybeans, it's a protein. When you put it on cells in a culture, you alter something called histone acetylation, which in turn changes the pattern of genes that are turned on. In addition to this one patient in this video, we heard from several others, 15 others around the world, who had tried this with ALS and said that it was helping. We never did get enough medical records on anyone else to prove it. <clears throat> From the company, we were told the side effects with this product were extremely rare. The one concern that we had was that it was expensive, $700 a month to use this product. But for the people in my trial, we got the product from the company for free. So 
We did one of those unusual trials, and there was some good news and some bad news. It's now finished, it's published. The bad news, this product wasn't quite as safe as we were led to believe. People in the study had side effects, including some very unusual and severe side effects, like cases of constipation so bad that we had to hospitalize people to get them over it. We couldn't find any biomarker evidence of altered histone acetylation in people. We couldn't find anyone that had an ALS reversal, none of the 50 people that we studied on this for a year, and we couldn't even find any evidence that it really slowed the progression down. But the good news is that this unusual design worked really well. This was the fastest enrolling trial in the history of ALS. We enrolled more than nine patients per site per month. We enrolled a very diverse population, people with ALS for more than a decade. Some people with ALS were quadriplegic on ventilators, and they were in this study. We had better retention in spite of enrolling these far advanced patients than most ALS clinical trials. 84% of those who were alive at the end of the study were still with us and still entering data. <clears throat> patients did a great job entering their data on patients like me, and the things they measured agreed almost perfectly with what we were measuring in clinic, suggesting that we really don't, if we're looking for such a big signal, we really don't need to have people come in so often. And we found that there were hundreds of people all over the world that tried to protocol with their own doctors. That was the so-called play-along-at-home cohort. So we're gonna do more of our trials, and I'm gonna tell you about the next one in a few minutes. But in the meantime, we gotta think about some other explanations. What if it's not the products, right? I mean, all these 41 people did something different. So is it possible there's some other explanation for why they got better? Well, the most common explanation that I hear from my colleagues when I talk about this at meetings is that these people never had ALS in the first place. Well, it's a tough argument to make because nobody has a diagnostic test that is 100% accurate for ALS. It's a diagnosis based on a certain history, a certain exam, a certain EMG, and a certain panel of tests to rule out mimics. All these people had all those things. So if they had a mimic, it's something that has either never been described or only rarely been described before. It's difficult to figure out how to test for something that's never been described before. The argument I would make against these ALS reversals being mimics is this. 10% of these people had a family history of ALS. That's exactly the same as what we see in the ALS population at large. Why would 10% of these people have had a family history of ALS if they had an ALS mimic? And some of these people had kind of a dramatic family history. So this is a pedigree, and those, uh, those orange circles, the one kind of in the middle, that's the ALS reversal. And you'll notice that he had a brother that died from ALS, he had a son who has ALS, and he had other relatives with other neurodegenerative diseases, including frontal temporal dementia and Parkinsonism. So there's something going on in this guy, probably a type of familial ALS, but for some reason he was able to beat it. So one of the explanations I think is the, is the most exciting is that what if these 41 people have something genetic about them that makes them resistant to ALS? Right? If I could figure out what that was, I might be able to give that to everybody. And it might sound far-fetched, but it turns out there's a precedent for this. So in the HIV world, there's a group of people that get infected with this virus, and they never get sick. They never progress to AIDS, even though they never take any medicine. We've known about them for 30 years. They're called elite controllers. And for a long time, people looked at these patients and said, I don't know what's going on. But finally, somebody put them all into the same database, and it turns out that most of them have an abnormality in a gene called CCR5. The abnormality they have is called CCR5 delta 32. So researchers said, well, what does that gene do? It codes for a protein on the surface of all of our cells that HIV needs to get in. And in these elite controllers, that protein is bent. So HIV can't use it to get into cells. So Pfizer actually used this information to develop a drug that works on that protein called Meraviroc, and it works for everybody with HIV. So that's exactly what I'm hoping I can find in these ALS reversals. <clears throat> There's one other explanation that we've come up with, and this one is, again, uh, I think kind of interesting. What if these reversals were exposed to something early in their life that somehow immunized them against ALS? So again, there's examples of this, right? 
That's what immunizations are. We expose people to either a dead or an attenuated virus, and then we hope that that triggers an immune response so that they never get the full virus later in their life. And as I'm sure you know, there actually is a vaccine against another motor neuron disease called polio. There are also examples of naturally occurring vaccines. So there are several papers out there uh, that try to argue that there are certain childhood infections that if you get them, you might be protected later in life from ever getting an autoimmune disease. And there's a really interesting mouse study that suggests that bites from normal mosquitoes actually confer resistance to malaria in a mouse. So if you have this mouse bit by lots of healthy mosquitoes, and then you put in some malaria-infected mosquitoes, it doesn't get sick. Really interesting. So to investigate these hypotheses, I created this program called STAR, Study of ALS Relations. And there's four parts to it. We're trying to find more of these cases. We're trying to put them in the same database for the first time. And that's going to help us understand if they look any different from a person with typically progressive ALS in terms of you know, how fast they progress, what the demographics are. We're trying to get blood samples on as many as we can to do whole genome sequencing. And we're trying to ask them as many questions as we can about exposures. And so we're starting to get some data back now from the STAR program. So these tables uh, are from a paper that was published, I think, a year and a half ago now. And again, I'm, I'm sorry they're kind of hard to see, but they do say that the ALS reversals look a little bit different from people with typically progressive ALS. They tend to be a little younger. They're more likely to be male. They're more likely to have limb onset disease, and they progress faster before they start getting better than the average person with ALS. We've also figured out that these people are different in terms of the things they take, the AOTs. And over on that right-hand side of that slide is a list of some of the AOTs that are most significantly associated with ALS reversals. And there's one that rises right to the top. It's called curcumin. And uh, since this slide was made, we've actually now found a total of five people that have had an ALS reversal associated with curcumin. Curcumin is a, uh, it's a molecule that's found in the spice turmeric. It appears to be able to do a lot of interesting things to cells and culture. It's anti-inflammatory, it's antioxidant. Um, it may even be able to alter the fecal microbiome, getting back to what we were talking about with fecal transplants. So, Curcumin is going to be the next thing that I study in my board program because of that table. As far as the genetics, we've got all the samples collected. We've partnered with a group called CREATE down at the University of Miami. They're actually going to be doing the extractions and the whole genome sequencing and working with another institution called St. Jude to compare all that genetic data in the ALS reversals to a giant group of people with more typically progressive ALS. And we hope to have those results by the end of 2019. And then finally, for the environmental exposure study, this is a poster that my medical student is going to be presenting tomorrow at the American Academy of Neurology. So what we did here is we partnered with the National ALS Registry, and we asked our reversals all the same questions as all the people in the registry are getting asked about lifetime exposures. They're called the risk factor modules. So there's a lot, of, a lot of information here, a lot of different questions that we asked. And we looked for something called an odds ratio. What are the odds that this particular exposure correlates with an ALS reversal versus someone with more typically progressive ALS? Most people say that an odds ratio of two is kind of the minimum that you would look at as being interesting. Well, there's only one odds ratio that really jumped out as being interesting. So the odds of being a woodworker or cabinet maker was 14 in the LS reversals, 14 times greater in the LS reversals than in healthy controls. That's a huge odd ratio. So now we're trying to scratch our heads and wonder what is possible there's something in wood. And we've, we've you know, scoured the epidemiology literature, and there's a lot of things in wood. You know, in addition to just sawdust itself, there's terpenes, there's formaldehyde. So is it possible that an early life exposure to something like that sets you up to be immune to a disease like ALS later in life. We'll have to do some more work on that. So just to kind of wrap this up, I've shown you today that when it comes to AOTs, like they used to say on the X-Files, the truth is out there, but it's really not easy to find. 
anecdotal is this, anecdotal data is especially problematic in ALS, and it's commonly misinterpreted. We've got this program now called ALS Untangled that uses social networking to bring patients together with clinicians and scientists so we can systematically review these AOTs, including help you to understand the anecdotes on them. It turns out that some anecdotes probably are worth paying attention to. Those are what I call the dramatic ALS reversals. And we've got two programs underway at Duke to try to understand these. Roar, a pilot pro a trial program looking at some of the same AOTs that the ALS reversals used. And the STAR program looking at things like genetics and environmental exposures. So uh, on my last slide, I just want to thank the following groups. Patients with ALS, thank you so much for coming out today. You know, one of my favorite things about coming here is to see all of you. You really inspire me to go back and work even harder. You inspire me every day to keep doing the things I do. The groups that fund me, the ALS Association and the MNDA, as well as the LBH ALS Foundation, without your support, we wouldn't be half as far along as we are. My collaborators from all around the world, patients like me, Neurobank, Origins, all the doctors and scientists from all the other countries that volunteer their time. And then finally, my Duke ALS team, for helping me to build a foundation of great patient care upon which all this research is built. So thank you very much. I'll be happy to answer any questions.
wanted to know about, um, I felt like the onset of his ALS could have been an exposure to chemicals because he was diabetic and drank Diet Pepsi for 100 years and that is, you know, it has the um, uh, the one aspartame. Uh, aspartame in it and it, I told him that's really bad for you. He didn't listen. <laughs> and then also he worked in a chemical plant where they did pesticides for 30 years. So I felt like um, to try to eliminate all these chemicals and all these things that could have, you know, triggered something like that. Do they feel that there are certain ALS um, patients that that is a possibility that is triggered by something like that? Yeah, yeah. So um, as you know, there's there's two categories of ALS. Familial, where we know the cause, it's genetic. 30 subtypes now of just familial ALS. And sporadic, where we don't know the cause. We think there's something in the environment, maybe toxins. So there's sort of two stories on sporadic ALS that I think are have the strongest evidence right now. What is the story of the toxin beta methylamine BMAA? Do you know that story? That story started on the island of Guam about 50 years ago it was recognized that people living on this island had a 50 to 100 times more likely uh, risk of getting ALS. So epidemiologists flocked there and said, well, what is going on? What is here? And they found that when the people on the island died, their brains were full of this chemical, BMAA, beta methylmethylamine. So the search was on to try to figure out where it was coming from. In the first place, they found it were in these seeds. And then somebody said, eh, there's not really enough in there to account for what we're seeing in the brains. Then they found it in flying squirrels which was another unusual dietary habit of the people that lived on this island. And there, there was pretty high concentrations in the squirrels. And the squirrel hypothesis also explained why the risk of ALS on Guam has dropped. Those squirrels became extinct and the risk started dropping. But it never went back down to normal. It's still five times more likely on Guam than anywhere else. And so they found another source, which becomes relevant to everyone, blue-green algae. Blue-green algae make BMAA. And if you're around blue-green algae, you probably can inhale it. If you swim in water with blue-green algae, you probably can absorb it. So uh, there's a lot of evidence for this. There's actually an epidemiology study looking at the risk of ALS in New England. It's 25 times higher around this body of water that's concentrated blue-green algae. It's twice as high downwind as it is upwind on that lake. Um, we've looked at autopsy specimens from people who died from ALS from North America. Some of them have really high levels of this toxin. We think we understand how this toxin causes disease and how to block it with an amino acid called L-serine. And there's a, a small pilot trial that suggested that was probably safe. There was a hint that it might be helping. But the thing that's going to limit us there is we don't know how to measure the toxin in living people. So I, I believe there is a subset of people who get it because of that toxin, but I don't know how to find them. So a lot of my patients in my clinic do take L-serine because <coughs> it's a simple, safe, non-toxic thing they can do. The other hypothesis that I think has a lot of merit is the HERV-K hypothesis. This is kind of not exactly environmental, but close. So 30 years ago, it was recognized that a bunch of uh, young men in San Francisco were coming down with what looked like rapidly progressive ALS. It's a weird demographic. It usually affects older folks. Not always, but usually. And it was recognized that these people also had HIV. And as we started to get better medicines for HIV, it was recognized that when you treated somebody with ALS and HIV, a lot of times the ALS-like thing went away. So it suggested that HIV, a retrovirus, could cause ALS. And so for years, people looked for another retrovirus that could do it, and they didn't find it. Like I, I ask all my patients, if they have HIV risk, I test them, I never find it. If they don't have HIV risk, be risk which most of them don't, I don't test them. It turns out there's retroviruses that live inside us. They're called endogenous retroviruses. We inherited them from our ancestors. And most people thought they were just part of what we call junk DNA, just DNA that doesn't do anything. But a few years ago, this guy at the NIH looked to see if any of these retroviruses might get expressed in people with ALS. It's a very small study, but almost every patient that he looked at with sporadic ALS had a re-expression of this one retrovirus called HERV-K. No healthy controls did. And when he took that retrovirus and put it in motor neurons in a dish, they died. When you put that retrovirus in a mouse, the mouse got an ALS-like disease. So it really looks like that retrovirus could be really important. <laughs> so there's a group in Australia that's studying an antiretroviral drug called Triunec. 
and they, they released their um, results from their pilot trial this past summer, it's called the Lighthouse Trial. They had the biggest signal that I've ever seen in a clinical trial. It slowed the progression of ALS by 70%. And so they're, they're now getting into the replication of that trial. It's going to mostly be done over in Europe. But again, that's one where we'd have to have an assay. We'd have to be able to test you and know if HERFK was getting re-expressed. And it's not anything that we can do in the clinic. So like, when I give these talks back in North Carolina, people come in the week after and they say, I want to be tested for that BMAA and that HERFK. I said, I'd love to test you for those, but I don't have any tests for them. So getting back to your original question, yeah, I mean, it's a plausible hypothesis, but in science, we always have to think, okay, how are we going to test this? Like, it, how do we measure those chemicals? And especially if they may not be there anymore after all those years, it's, it's just really daunting to think about how to do that study. But it's definitely a, a good theory. All right, I'm getting the hook. And I would argue for a genetic predisposition to a toxin because in L Siri, there's been some studies showing uh, abnormalities of the enzymes that metabolize this L Siri that might underlie that. So it may be a combination making it an even more complex situation, plus the fact that ALS is not one disease, okay? So that we have subgroups, and that's one of the daunting things for us to approach, and may, as uh, Rick pointed out, there may be responder populations. So, thank you very much, Rick, that was great. Thank you.